Hi guys, my name is Jack, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. On December 20th, 2017, a press conference was held during which Mark Perez, special agent in charge of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, announced a breakthrough in the disappearance of Mike Williams, a Tallahassee real estate appraiser who was originally presumed to have drowned while duck hunting on Lake Seminole on December 16th, 2000, and was eaten by alligators. Being here now, I can tell you what happened to Mike Williams, Perez said. Mike Williams did not drown in the lake. He wasn't eaten by alligators. He didn't leave town and leave his wife and 18-month-old daughter behind. He was murdered. In the interest of the investigation, we cannot yet release details, but I am happy to report that this morning investigators notified the Williams family of recent discoveries in the case. Today's story is not only about love, betrayal, infidelity, and greed, but also about a mother's resilience. For 17 years and four days, Cheryl Williams, Mike's mom, disagreed that her son had drowned in Lake Seminole and pushed with tenacity for law enforcement to investigate her son's disappearance. She believed with all her heart that those responsible would be punished, believed even when no one else did. I had two choices. He was alive or dead. I chose to believe he was alive, and I really think that's what helped me, Cheryl said on December 20th, 2017. A lot of people called me crazy, but if I had given up, we never would have found him. The day before the press conference, Brian Winchester, a close friend of Mike and his wife Denise, who later married Brian, was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Mike's mother was right. Retribution came to those responsible, and ironically, they were the cause of the truth coming out. In 2000, Brian and Denise's affair, which began in 1997, turned into a murder. And years later, they went from lovers to strangers who didn't trust each other. Brian was very afraid that after the divorce, Denise would inform the police about what had happened to Mike, so he attacked her. Denise, on the other hand, went to great lengths to get him a life sentence. She was very persuasive in asking the jury for the maximum sentence, and it was these efforts that led to Brian having nothing to lose, and he made a deal with the prosecutor. Brian was sentenced to 20 years in 2017 for the kidnapping of Denise Williams, but he avoided a life sentence. Denise was celebrating the victory and was unaware that the conviction was part of a deal in which Brian Winchester, 49, admitted to planning the murder and a 17-year cover-up of the murder and received immunity from any prosecution for his role in the case. In exchange, he led investigators to Mike's body and gave a full and truthful confession. It would only be a few months later, and on May 8, 2018, Denise Williams would be arrested. At first glance, things are a little confusing, aren't they? Let's break down this case in detail. Jerry Michael Williams was born on October 16, 1969, in Bradfordville, north of Tallahassee, the son of a bus driver and a kindergarten teacher. Family and friends called him Mike. Even though the family didn't have much money, and the boy, along with his older brother, grew up living in a trailer. Those were happy times. The parents cared about their son's future, and instead of building a house, they set aside money for the education of both boys, who themselves worked part-time at night in supermarkets. The sons enrolled in North Florida Christian High School. There, Mike excelled. He became student council president, played soccer, and was active in the key club. At the age of 15, Mike started duck hunting as a hobby and met Denise Merrill. The young lad was a soccer player and student council president. Denise was a cheerleader and council secretary, and they began dating. Friends thought they were a great couple. While still in high school, Mike became best friends with Brian Winchester, whom Denise introduced him to. Brian later had a friend, Katie Thomas, and the two couples remained friends for the rest of Mike's life. After high school, Mike attended Florida State University where he majored in political science and urban planning. The lovers graduated together. Denise became a public accountant. Mike became a real estate appraiser. Mike proved to be a valuable worker. He often worked 15 hours a day, and of course his career took off. In 1994, the young successful man married Denise. It was around this time that Brian married Kathy as well. All four of them continued to stay in close contact. Mike loved his wife dearly, strived to provide for their family as best he could, and had incredible energy. At the age of 31, 
Mike Williams achieved considerable success. As a real estate appraiser, he was earning nearly $200,000 a year. The couple was able to afford a home in a small upscale neighborhood on the east side of town and in 1999 became happy parents. They had a daughter, whom the couple named Ansley. Mike's friends told me that he was always prudent. Since the young man was engaged in quite risky activities, he wanted to be sure that in case of disaster, his family would definitely be taken care of. Not surprisingly, Mike turned to his best friend who was working as an insurance agent at the time. Brian sold him two insurance policies for $250,000 and later for $500,000. In 2000, Mike's father passed away. Williams was so stunned by this suddenness that, wanting to financially secure his own family, he again turned to a friend. Brian helped Mike to insure his life for $1 million. Thus, about six months before his disappearance, the life of the loving father of the family was insured for almost $2 million. According to Denise, on the morning of December 16, 2000, her husband woke up early to go duck hunting on Lake Seminole, a large reservoir connected to the Apalachicola River. It was the day of their sixth wedding anniversary, and the couple planned to celebrate the date at night in Apalachicola, a small town on the bayou. The wife and daughter waited for Mike at home at noon, but he never returned. Naturally, Denise became concerned and called her father, who in turn called Mike's best friend, Brian Winchester. Together with his father, Brian drove to Lake Seminole. There they found Mike's Ford Bronco car near the boat dock. But Mike himself was nowhere to be found. The men went around to all the places Mike liked to hunt, but couldn't even find the boat. So they decided to call the police. After investigators from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Agency were called, the search for Mike began. A few hours later, a helicopter pilot found the boat drifting about 225 feet from the boat ramp. A search of the boat turned up Mike's shotgun, still in its case. Apparently, he never got to use it. The search became a rescue operation. Locals believed that before the three rivers were dammed to form the lake, the reservoir was the site of an orchard. Thus, the lake got its name Stump Field, due to the many remaining stumps that protruded above and below the water level, requiring careful handling of any motorized boat in the area. Because of this, searchers speculated that Williams hit a stump on his boat, fell out, and submerged himself in the water. His wading boots filled with water, and he probably drowned when he couldn't get out. Several other agencies were called in to help, including a dive team from Montgomery, Alabama, and the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. But the extensive and methodical search yielded nothing. Mike was never located. A week passed and the rescue operation turned into a body search operation. Teams were given probe poles to probe the bottom of the lake, and dogs were brought to the site. Ten days into the search, volunteers found a camouflage-patterned hunting hat that could not be linked to Williams. Officials with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Agency speculated that Mike had been eaten by alligators, which is why the body could not be found. There were actually quite a few alligators living in the lake. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement found no signs indicating a violent death and agreed with that theory. After five weeks, the search was called off. The day after the search was called off, Denise held a memorial service for Mike, less than two months after the alleged accident. It seemed to everyone that Denise had come to terms with the loss of her husband, but Mike's mother had not. Six months later, in June 2001, an angler discovered wading boots floating in the lake. Divers searched the lake area and retrieved a lightweight hunting jacket and flashlight from the bottom. In one of the jacket's pockets was a hunting license with Williams's name and signature. The find raised many questions. Neither the hunting jacket nor the boots had visible teeth marks indicative of an alligator attack. None of the items found showed signs of having been in the water for six months. The boots were not slimy and the flashlight still worked. However, a week later, Denise's attorney asked the court to declare Mike Williams dead. Based on the items found, he suggested that alligators and other aquatic life had swallowed the body whole. The motion was granted. The death certificate said Mike died on December 16, 2000. Cause of death, accidental drowning while duck hunting on Lake Seminole. The body has yet to be recovered. 
This is how Mike Williams' story might have ended if not for Cheryl Williams, who refused to give up and continued to search for her son. All I know is that I can't stop looking for him until I find him, she said. Cheryl's efforts seriously strained her relationship with her former sister-in-law. Denise demanded she stop searching and accept reality. She said, I'm tired of seeing articles about Mike and his disappearance. I just want to move on with my life. If you keep pushing this investigation, you will never see your granddaughter again. Cheryl couldn't give up on her son, and Denise carried out her threat. If not for the mother's persistence, her son's story might have remained submerged at the bottom of a dark, algae-covered lake. It took Cheryl Williams three years to convince law enforcement officials to open an investigation into her young son's disappearance. I made phone calls, put up signs about my missing son, wrote to the governor of Florida every day, compiled my notes into an evidence book, asked people to post on social media and contacted reporters, Cheryl will tell you years later. The persistent mother contacted Matthew Oresco, an alligator expert. In his response, he explained that alligators do not feed during the cold winter months. Cold weather causes water temperatures to drop, so alligators don't feed in the winter. All they do is maintain their body temperature. 14 degrees is too cold for an alligator to be interested in food at all. Moreover, Oresco wrote that after an alligator kill, there is always forensic evidence left behind. Eventually, after three years, Cheryl Williams convinced law enforcement to drop the ridiculous alligator theory and launch an official investigation into her son's disappearance. The case was reopened because of little-known facts regarding alligators' eating habits. Evidence gathered from interviews and a little official data convinced investigators that Williams' death was no accident. My gut feeling is that Mike did not die in Lake Seminole, and that's the general consensus of all the law enforcement agencies working on this case, said Ronnie Austin, a former investigator with the 2nd District State's Attorney's Office who prosecuted Mike's case. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Agency initially took over the case because Williams was considered a missing hunter. Officers spent 735 hours searching a 10-acre section of the lake for the body, but didn't spend a minute looking for signs of wrongdoing. Jackson County Sheriff's deputies brought in to help with the search also did not consider other possibilities. Investigators interviewed everyone involved in the search and police officer, David Arnett, who was present at the scene that day, years later said, Some things immediately look strange. Williams didn't usually hunt alone. His truck was found in an undeveloped area from which he would have had to drag the boat over mud, not on the nearby concrete boat launch he usually used. The terrible storm that night should have pushed the boat to the east shore, but it was found on the west shore. The boat's motor wasn't running, but it was full of gasoline. If Mike had been driving the boat and fell out of it, it would have continued to float in circles until it ran out of gas. Unfortunately, law enforcement began to doubt too late that they were dealing with a simple drowning. The crime scene had already been trampled by numerous volunteers and searchers. A car that could have served as a clue was taken by the family without any verification. Potential witnesses were missed. Denise Williams and Brian Winchester became suspicious to investigators because they learned that Winchester had divorced his wife Kathy and married Denise. They also learned of Denise's unexpected financial gain of nearly $2 million from her late husband's life insurance policy. Detectives determined that it was Winchester who sold the policy to Mike. They also found it strange that Denise, as Mike's wife, did not want to have anything to do with the investigation and tried to prevent Cheryl's activity, even forbidding the grandmother to communicate with her granddaughter. In 2005, the newly married couple were called in for questioning which gave nothing new to the investigation. Brian provided an alibi for the morning of the disappearance of Mike Williams. He said he was 60 miles from the lake, at home, in bed, as his ex-wife Kathy could attest. He said he had intended to go hunting with his father-in-law in the morning, but overslept. Denise's interrogation also yielded no new leads. In 2008, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement announced that Mike's disappearance was not an accident and they believe he was the victim of a crime. However, without sufficient evidence, they, alas, cannot prosecute. We have suspicions, but we need proof. Another investigation failed to find out her son's fate, but Cheryl Williams did not give up again. 
Her efforts led to the Discovery Cable Channel doing a story on Mike's disappearance and subsequent investigations in late 2011. By then, Cheryl had become disillusioned with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, believing it was either incompetent or uninterested in solving the case. Beginning in 2012, Mike's mother wrote about one letter a day to the governor, Rick Scott, asking him to either assign the investigation to another agency or appoint a special prosecutor to do so. Cheryl sent 2,600 letters to the governor over nine years. In 2012, Denise caught Brian cheating and they broke up. The following year, Denise filed for divorce. After a few more years, an appraisal of the former family home was to take place, after which even property issues would no longer bind them. This event was a turning point in Mike's case. Brian didn't want a divorce. Denise didn't want to continue the relationship. They were constantly fighting, and the Williams investigation was poking fun at them. Brian would call Denise, and she stopped returning his calls. He couldn't handle the stress level. On August 5, 2016, the day a real estate appraisal was due as part of a court order, Denise left her home to drive to work at Florida State University. While talking to her sister on the phone, she saw someone climb over the back seat of her car. It turned out to be Winchester. Brian pressed a loaded gun against Denise's ribs and told her to drive straight ahead. He said he had to do that because she wasn't answering his calls. Denise tried to calm Brian down, agreed with everything he said, and promised to give him a chance to save their marriage. Brian believed it. Denise assured him that she wouldn't go to the police and report what he had just done, and Brian got out of the car. As he got out, he took the brown sheet, plastic sheeting, bleach sprayer, and tools with him. It became clear that Denise had miraculously escaped death. Denise called emergency services. Brian was quickly arrested and charged with kidnapping, which is a first-degree felony in Florida, and carries a life sentence as the maximum penalty. He was also charged with domestic violence and armed burglary. The court decided to keep Brian in custody without bail. Cheryl Williams expressed hope that this development will lead to the solving of her son's disappearance case. Brian is not going to let Denise run around alone with all that money, she told the New York Daily News. I pray that he will tell us what really happened. And Brian did tell, bargaining himself an extremely favorable deal with the prosecutor and avoiding a life sentence. At first, I think we were all doing really well. But I wasn't a good husband, Brian began his story. One day, I found a note in my first wife Kathy's purse and realized she was cheating on me. I wanted revenge. We often went to bars and concerts with Denise and Mike. I had been friends with Denise since high school. I was never really attracted to her. But after Kathy cheated on me, I started looking at other women differently. The affair between Brian and Denise began in October 1997. One-time drunken sex at a rock concert quickly escalated to frequent secret meetings. We started meeting at hotels during the workday. We met whenever we had the opportunity. Brian recounted. He did not want to divorce. Denise made it clear that she would never divorce her husband. Public opinion was important to her, and she did not want to share custody of her daughter. Over time, the affair became more than just meeting for casual sex. Denise and Brian thought of themselves as a couple, exchanging gifts and love letters. It became clear that they couldn't go on like this. They could not be without each other, and divorce was unacceptable to Denise. Her pious image was not to be harmed. Around this time, Mike almost died in a hunting accident. Brian saved him, and Denise suddenly saw a way out of the situation. After the deal with the prosecutor, Brian will reveal, the year 2000 prompted us to start talking about Mike and Kathy's death. Denise wanted it all on me, not her. And she wanted a scenario where it wasn't a murder, but an accident. She wanted death to be left up to God. That way she could live with it. After considering various options, Brian and Denise settled on a boating accident. In doing so, they timed the murder so that they could get the maximum possible payout on Mike's life insurance policy. They both realized that Mike had to be killed before one of the three policies expired at the end of December 2000. The plan was in place. Brian called his friend to go hunting. He said he'd found a great spot on the shores of Lake Seminole. Mike expected to go there with Brian and return home by noon to celebrate his anniversary with his wife. 
I told him that we were going to go to a special place and that he absolutely had to bring his wading boots with him. I had to make sure he took them with him because it was believed that if you fell overboard in wading boots, you would drown very quickly. The plan was to make death look like an accidental drowning. Once Brian and Mike were in the water, Brian pushed Mike out of the boat, but instead of sinking, he grabbed onto the stumps and began to wade through them to the shore. Brian panicked. I didn't know what to do. Mike started calling loudly for help. I didn't know how to get out of this situation. I had a shotgun. I was panicking and I shot him in the head. I didn't think about what I was doing. Things didn't go according to plan, and I needed to cover up what happened. There was hardly any time left. I should have been back home by now and getting ready to go hunting with my father-in-law. No one knew I was at the lake with Mike, so I decided it would be best for me to drive home and pretend like I had overslept. I drove home and hoped that Kathy was still asleep. I entered the house as quietly as I could. Katie was asleep. My phone was on the floor. I went to bed, called my father-in-law, and apologized. Brian did everything he could to create an alibi for himself. Then he hid the body. Denise didn't know that Brian had shot Mike in the head and buried him. Brian tried to tell her, but she didn't want to listen. It was enough for her that her husband was gone. Denise wanted to go on living with the idea that it was God who kept him from swimming out and let him drown. According to Brian, they promised each other that neither of them would ever say anything. Denise and Brian justified what happened by saying that the main reason Mike was killed was because it was impossible for them to live together. We said the money was just the cherry on the cake, Brian would pronounce in court. Investigators learned that it was Brian who planted a hat, boots, flashlight, and license. First, he needed to keep a searchers from leaving a lake, and afterwards, he needed grounds to pronounce Mike dead so Denise could get insurance, since a recognition process usually takes about five years. The lovers managed it in just seven months. Including Social Security and other benefits, Denise received about $2 million. On May 8, 2018, Denise Williams was charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and accessory to a felony, which carried a life sentence. Denise pleaded not guilty to all three charges. In February 2019, she was sentenced to life in prison. Five months later, Mike and Denise's daughter Ansley received all of her late father's assets and insurance money owed to Denise. In January 2020, Denise Williams appealed the conviction and life sentence. Her attorney argued before Florida's First District Court of Appeal that there was no evidence that she was involved in committing the murder. In November 2020, the murder conviction was overturned, but the 30-year sentence for conspiracy to commit murder was upheld. Denise is now in custody at the Florida Women's Reception Center. She will be 78 years old when she is released. Brian Winchester was transferred to Madison Correctional Institute in Florida to serve the remainder of his sentence. His current release date is set for July 30th, 2036. He will be 67 years old. Ansley, daughter of Mike and Denise, insists her mother is innocent and places the blame on Brian Winchester. She refused to speak to any media regarding the outcome of the case and her personal life. According to Cheryl and Nick, Ansley's uncle, they have not been able to connect with Ansley. Cheryl is very sorry that she has lost not only her son, but also her granddaughter. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead.